name's Chris Priest. I'm going to be speaking about crowdsourcing, and it's a double bill, actually. It's myself, and I'll be followed by Ed McClough. And I am an academic from Bristol University, and I'm interested in crowdsourcing and digital engagement, and that's why I really enjoyed, I, unfortunately, for various reasons, I haven't been, here, been able to be here for very long, but I enjoyed the conversations I heard this morning to hear the, the kind of depth of experiential knowledge that you guys have about how to engage people digitally uh, for worthwhile causes. Um, what I want to do, so the work that I've been doing, the research I've been doing, has been to do with uh, how, crowdsour how to engage people in crowdsourcing at, for um, community action purposes, and I want to say a little bit about that, but I'm really going to be speaking more generally about crowdsourcing, to think about, and this is partly a question from me to you, because I as an academic, uh, and I would describe myself as an engaged academic, my main motivation is not to public publish papers, but that keeps my funders happy. My main motivation is to have some kind of impact in the world uh, along the lines which probably motivates some of you as well. So, um, so par partly the reason for me doing this is as a question to you folks is about how this kind of technology, <coughs> this kind of way of doing things might be of use to you and what things you might need to think through and what maybe you already have thought through. And so in particular, I'm interested if people want to kind of follow on and explore this in the future. I'm interested in having more conversations at a later date. Uh, Ed McClough is, has developed uh, one of the, possibly even the first, kind of crowdsourcing platform which allows people to put, put up crowdsourcing applications fairly rapidly to meet your particular needs. And Ed's going to take over for me. We're doing a kind of double act. Ed will take over for me at some point. And he'll demonstrate the work they've been doing, particularly the application they've been doing in Guadalajara which uh, I'm looking forward to seeing because it sounds really interesting. So anyhow, I'm going to paint the big picture and give you a few examples, and Ed will go into more detail on one particular uh, example that he's been working on. OK, so what is crowdsourcing? So crowdsourcing is effectively how, if you enlist, a way of enlisting a crowd of humans to help solve a problem. This is a, a um, definition from an academic paper. Uh, to solve a problem defined by the system owners. And there's many examples of crowdsourcing online which you'll be familiar with. So Wikipedia is a good example. Open source computing, Mozilla, that sort of thing, is another good example of crowdsourcing, where people come together to build some kind of artifact together. Uh, then we have, uh, as well as building ar artifacts, you can have a, a large task which is distributed, and many people do a little bit of that task, and altogether it results in that task being done. So that's another way of, doing, uh, of crowdsourcing. And finally, some kind of contributing to some evaluation. So reviewing and voting at Amazon is, again, an example of, of crowdsourcing, where you get aggregated information about people's opinions is an example of crowdsourcing. So crowdsourcing is not new, and uh, though Ed actually said that the example I'm about to give is, is kind of a special case. So because crowd, if you take one example of crowdsourcing is that RSPB has done uh, surveys of bird populations for decades. Okay. So that's kind of an example of where crowdsourcing has been taking place without use of uh, IT. Though Ed pointed out that there's very few examples like that, and the RSPB effectively exploits the, the uh, intense dedication of its members, the birders there. So, um, so I'd be interested to find if there's any more examples of, of decadal old, uh, old crowdsourcing. If anyone can think of one, please do let me know. But what's key about what's happening now is that the social computing platforms, the web and mobile technology, make crowdsourcing a lot easier. Um, it makes it easier for people to set it up, it makes it easier for people to conduct, and it makes it easier, it's easier for people to take part. So all those things together mean that crowdsourcing is undergoing a, um, a kind of spread of things. So what exactly, I'm going to give you some examples now. So this is an example of crowdsourcing, something called Mechanical Turk, which isn't available in the, in the UK. Mechanical Turk is effectively where organisations can pay people to do small jobs. Uh, it's run by Amazon. Uh, people, people have paid a small amount to do a small job. It might be, for instance, to copy a, a, um, a picture of a receipt into text form or something, and they get paid maybe six cents for it. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not that interested in this sort of thing. I'm not interested in paid crowdsourcing. I'm interested in volunteer crowdsourcing. And interestingly, I know that there's a gentleman from the, uh, um, the TUC here. Um, I'm being interviewed next week by someone from the German equivalent of the TUC for a book he's writing about why this kind of thing is evil. And, and I, I said, I'm very happy to talk about why that kind of thing is evil, but I'd also like to talk about how voluntary crowdsourcing can be used to support positive things for the union movement in Germany. And he said, great, no one suggested that so far. Let's talk about that too. Um, 
So I'm more interested, as I say, in, in voluntary crowdsourcing for engagement. So another example, which some of you might have come across, there's, there's a set of applications called a kind of Galaxy Zoo. And this is one example. This is Planet Hunters. And this is an application on the web where people are looking for um, planets which are orbiting stars other than our sun. And the way they do is they get shown the, um, the astronomy, uh, the dudes with the telescopes are pointing it at these stars and watching what happens to the light from that star. Does the star go up and down? The light go up and down? And if it dips on a regular basis, it might be because there is a planet orbiting in front of it. So that's what you're looking for. And they can't easily necessarily detect that. So what they do is they send it out and ask people to look at the data. And do you see any examples? Click yes or no. And whatever you click, it goes on to the next one. OK, so that, this is an example of citizen science, which Ed, some of you will have heard Ed speaking about yesterday. So here's another example of crowdsourcing. You might already have been involved with this piece of crowdsourcing without even knowing it. This is recapture. So recapture, you might know, to prove that you're a human being and not a robot, you sometimes have to enter information uh, on the system. Recapture is one of these tools. And what recapture does is it gives you a word, in this case overlooks, which it knows what it is. The other word is from an image that it wants to be digitized. So, and you type in both those words, and it checks that you got the second one right. And if you got the second one right, it assumes you got the first one right as well, which means you've done some work. You have digitized, on behalf of recapture, part of a document. Okay? So you're effectively um, providing a service in return for access to whatever website recapture has behind it. And I can't, re um, I, I can't remember who runs it, but it's, it is a charitable sort of thing. It's not a... It's not a commercial thing. It's a kind of charitable digitization. Another example of crowdsourcing, very different, is something that The Guardian did. I don't know if any of you... I, I did this as part of this. In 2011, the um, freedom of information in the state of Alaska, Alaska meant that Sarah Palin, all Sarah Palin's official emails were released to the public. However, they were released in paper form. Okay? So they didn't really want to release it in electronic form to make your job easy. They were released in paper form. Uh, not even PDF, just paper form. Um, a Guardian journalist sat in Alaska scanning all these bits of paper in, and the PDFs were put onto the Guardian website. Um, and then volunteers, as I say, I was one of them, would look at these PDF pages and see if they could find any dirt on Sarah Palin, effectively. Um, and if they did, they would send an email in and say, OK, I found something, and a journalist would look at it and see what they could find out. Um, so... And this is a quote, there was complaints about this. So there were complaints about this, about um, whether, they, whether it was overly, I don't know, scandalous, if you like, that they were digging for dirt uh, on her. And uh, this is a, so people wrote into the reader's editor, and this is a quote from the article that the reader's editor wrote afterwards. He said, basically, web techniques such as live blogging and crowdsourcing expose the process of a story in a way that was never done before, okay, which was largely hidden for the readers in the way that the story develops. Okay, because, so, whereas traditionally you only see the final product, in this way you're helping create it. And so as a result of that, in this case, there wasn't a lot of dirt in these emails. There was a few small pieces, but not, nothing really kind of sensational. And what they felt was that the amount of excitement it generated in the public beforehand uh, was, was, was kind of unwarranted. So in future, we should be wary of the glee quota until we know what we've got. So effectively, they were excited. They generated this excited from the public. And then they found that, to an extent, it wasn't justified by what the actual content of this e these emails. Yeah. Um, for those of you who are environmental, though, it was, it did, the one thing they did say that they did find a lot more about was rather about the cosy relationship between Sarah Palin and one of the energy people. I can't remember who it was. It might have been probably BP, to do with the Alaska pipeline. That was the one thing that they did actually pull out through this approach. OK, so why might an NGO crowdsource? Well, first of all, to get some kind of work done. So maybe data collection or simple analysis. You might have something that you want done, uh, and you can, you can uh, get people to do it. And I'm going to give you some example of how a small NGO in Bristol used that in a moment. But you could imagine uh, getting your supporters to go and collect data in the same way that the RSPB do with birds. To get your supporters to collect data about, for example, local environmental problems. Um, what shops stock what. For instance, recently, I know that, um, I think it was Avaz, was it Avaz? I can't remember. Someone was campaigning, no, it wasn't Avaz, it was a UK one, about um, illegal pesticides which had been outlawed in the EU being put up on um, eBay. Okay, I can't, sorry, I can't remember who that was. Um, 
Uh, and you could imagine that being done on, more on a local shop basis. You could imagine people going to shops and noticing an illegal pesticide and registering that they've seen it there. That's the sort of thing you can imagine being done. Okay, so to campaign. So as well as collecting data, you can actually use it to campaign. Uh, you can use it to place pressure. So if, oh, that previous example I gave could also be used for campaigning. You can use it to place pressure on people by making inf this information public. Um, to support the delivery of a charitable service, I'm going to give an example of that in a moment, uh, in Uganda, you can actually use the crowdsourcing, and in fact, I would say that the uh, Guadalajara work is, to an extent, supporting delivery of services. You can use it to support the delivery of service. And finally, to, finally to fundraise, and I'm not going to talk much about that, I'm sure there's more experts in here, uh, people who are more expert than I, but crowdfunding, you're probably aware of, crowdfunding which creates more of a bond because you feel that you are paying for that 1%, and you get some nice package back in return. So you probably, as I say, many of you will know about that, so I won't talk that much about that today. Okay, so an example. So this is, uh, these, the next two examples are ones that I've been involved with. This one was an idea from my, one of my master's students, or rather a student who then came to me asking me to supervise it, uh, a guy called Ben Collins. Uh, and uh, he had the idea, and it turned out he wasn't the first to have the idea, though he, he did it in a slightly more rich way, of how you could use uh, crowdsourcing information to provide a service to people in Uganda to improve their quality of access to water. Um, water supplies can be a significant distance from a village, about an hour walk, and, uh, what, and these wells would be shared between villages. And what would happen is that people would waste their time going to wells and finding out they were broken. Um, and so what he's developed is a mobile phone service which allows villagers to report whether a well is working or whether it's faulty. And then that information is distributed to the other villagers, the other villages, so people waste less time. It's also distributed to the NGO who's responsible for that well to allow them to mend it. And that second part, the idea of distributing to the villagers, was something that Ben was new, was new from what Ben was saying. But it turns out another organisation has done the second part, the, the part where um, you report on whether a well is working, and then the NGO comes comes uh, to fix it effectively. Um, so it allows repairs to be quicker, but also it allows broadcaster well status for the villagers to avoid the wasted trips. And one of the interesting questions from us is, um, I'm, I'm mostly used to thinking about doing it in a Western context, a Western developed context, but it's interesting, one of the, as I'll talk in a moment about, very important is how you motivate people to be engaged, in, uh, how you motivate people to do this. But what, what we're interested in in uh, Uganda is what motivations do the village people have and what will motivate them to do it and how different it is or similar it is to uh, a Western volunteer, if you like. Okay, so this is an, another project. This is a community group in the UK. Some of you might have come across the Close the Door campaign. It's closing the door against energy waste. The idea is to stop doors, uh, sorry, stop shops, heating streets in winter and cooling streets in summer. Okay, that's basically what, what it's about, keeping the doors shut. Um, and it's run by a very small number of dedicated volunteers. This is the entirety of Close the Doors Bristol you see in this photo. So that, but they're very dedicated. They'll go around visiting shops and getting them to sign up to the campaign. So the question we had is how can you use lightweight volunteers, people who are less committed than they are, but nonetheless are motivated, how can you use these lightweight volunteers to support them? And what we did, and also how can you use digital technology as a means of, again, lightweight campaigning to change the norm? How can you show that the the uh, doors closed norm is spreading through a community. Okay, so this is the app that we developed. So basically it allows you to log if a shop door is either open or closed. It can be viewed on a map. You'll see here the green doors are ones that uh, um, are, op uh, sorry, are kept shut. The red doors are ones that are left open. The orange doors are ones where they've been recorded as both open and shut over time. Um, and so basically what we were interested in doing is what would engage people to do this. And we looked, at, we looked at different versions. We looked at a version where you actually scored a gamified version. I know some of you folks use gamification to get people to support people in entering data. We looked at a gamified version where you re receive points, badges, and scores which are displayed on a leaderboard. Um, I'm not going to talk about We also had a financial motivation, which I don't really want to talk about today. And we had a control version which had no leaderboard. So we were interested in seeing the effect of this gamification on the participants. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about there in, in a moment in my, return, in my results. What I wanted to say, one of the things that came out w was we broadly looked at people's motivation for using this, not just the gamification, but more broadly. And one thing that was very interesting is that if you look at traditional crowdsourcing, which really is primarily about getting a job done, effectively, 
It's very, um, that's not quite true of citizen science. Uh, citizen, some of citizen science is true of this as well. But I would say there's added advantages to NGOs uh, for using crowdsourcing over traditional kind of getting the job done work. And that is that there's a kind of, kind of person that's in between the person who will click to sign a, um, an online petition and might make a contribution and the dedicated activist. There's a person who's in between those two positions. And this kind of technology allows those people to be engaged more effectively. That's what I would, I would say, I think this. So you can basically, rather than simply making, signing a petition or making a donation, but it's less than full-blown activism that you're, you're doing. So it basically account, empowers these casual, casual supporters to feel that they're part of something bigger. That's what's uh, special about it. And there are, obviously there are other examples of that where you kind of, um, you, you, you take some kind of action uh, as well. But crowdsourcing is, is another way of doing that. So it can promote a sense of belonging and long-term engagement by a volunteer. And also, and this was something that we found in our Close the Door trial, it acts as a gateway to deeper involvement, either as a campaigner or a donor. So we found that people who used the app were, became more interested in the problem than they, were, than, than they experienced beforehand. They became more interested. So they were more likely, for example, to make a comment to friends about sh uh, shops having their doors open or shut. They're more likely to make a comment to shopkeepers and it raises awareness and acts as a talking point. There was a lovely example where one of the women who was involved in the trial was a, 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 um, a waitress in a, in a restaurant, and she went into the restaurant, and she showed the manager of the restaurant. She said, hey, look at this app. It, people waste their, they leave their doors open. Um, you always leave your door open. I'm just going to log it. And so she logged it, and the next time she came to, back to work, she found that he was keeping the doors shut then. Okay, so it actually acted to change that person's um, behavior. Okay, so how do you motivate crowdsourcers? So both for recruitment, you need to motivate them both to recruit, in other words, to take the first step, and also long-term engagement. One thing, and this is something that's very important to you guys, I'm sure, is that intrinsic motiv motivation is very important. You know, how motivated are they by the cause? And that is a very good motivator. But we found that intrinsic motivation, motivation by the cause, is actually really only good at getting people to take the first step. Just because someone's motivated by a cause, it doesn't mean they'll make a longer term commitment. Okay. Um, so intrinsic motivation is important. Making it easy, it should be well designed with regard to interaction and thinking about how it fits with people's lifestyle. And also, most importantly, if you want a long term engagement, you need to provide feedback on the results. People need to understand how what they're doing fits in with a bigger picture of a campaign or whatever. So recruiting volunteers, as I said, Intrinsic motivation is what we call the threshold motivator, which is very good for people to, getting people to put their hand up, but it's not so good at getting people to stay the longer term and making a contribution in the longer term. So rather than targeting known supporters, for example, this is the advice we would give to someone like Close the Doors, rather than targeting known supporters, you might instead target online forums who, of people who have appropriate lifestyles. So in the case of Close the Doors, the people we found who made most contribution were young mums with babies and toddlers who were pushing around uh, their kids to keep them happy. And they were very happy just to log a few doors as they went by. Okay? So rather than contacting transition towns about this, you'd want to contact Mumsnet, but with an environmental message. You see what I mean? So you contact the people who have the right lifestyle, but you, you use the environmental mes message as a filter to get the right people. Okay, so the next quick thing is to do a competition of normification. My main area of research with the work I've been presenting so far is really about the effect of competition. I was interested in seeing how leadership, uh, how leaderboards, etc., affected the behaviour of the people. And it was very interesting what we saw. I'm not going to go into the full details. The full details are more subtle than what I'm going to say. But broadly what we saw is that the leaderboard encouraged those at the top to compete against each other. And they would push each other's scores up. But those that elsewhere would give up. Okay. So as a result of that, the leaderboard is a good way of encouraging excellence among a small, a small number of people. But it's not a good way of getting a large community to be engaged. That's what we found with the, uh, the Close the Doors work. Okay? So competitions, prizes, etc., which is, I, I don't know about in the NGO community, but local government people that I speak with, whenever you want people to do something, they always say, let's have a competition sort of thing. I'm exaggerating, of course, but it's very popular, a competition. Uh, people believe competitions motivate. They do motivate if you want a small number of excellent people, but they don't motivate a broader community. Okay. So it's less good for encouraging a community to do its best. 
So instead, you want to promote a sense of community and reflect social norms of contribution, something along the lines of, okay, uh, in a community, how do, you, um, how, do you, how do you reflect that everyone is making some kind of contribution uh, and encourage others to make a contribution alongside those? And one simple example of that, which some of you will already use, is that when you click on a petition, you see, okay, 30,000 other people have clicked on this petition. You know, that sort of sense of things. Okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna close up now and I'm gonna hand over to Ed. To summarize, so crowdsourcing can allow organizations to outsource tasks uh, to, to communities of volunteers. But I believe that's not why it's necessarily most important to NGOs. I believe it's most important because it will allow you to raise awareness and also allow a level of lightweight engagement, allow you to engage people in a lightweight way somewhere between the I'm signing petitions and I'm going to man the barricades position. So you can find that kind of sweet spot for engagement there. Um, and however, having said that, the design of the environment must be done with care. Uh, it must motivate those people and um, it, what you might think motivates some people might result in demotivation of others. So you need to think very carefully about the mechanisms for motivation. There's the risk of a collective reduction. Okay, so that's me finished. Thank you very much for listening.